All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Olga Joshi Hansen. I'm Chief Program Officer here at Grantmakers for Education. On behalf of um, Celine Coggins, our Executive Director and the rest of our team, I wanna thank you very much for joining us uh, today. It's, uh, it's the middle of December, a time when everyone is super busy. So we appreciate you making the time to be here for the last in our learning series on the future of education, investing in policy that transforms learning. Um, past webinars that we've had, have explored lots of topics um, around the future of education. The Spencer Foundation and Pi Delta Kappen had teamed up to publish a series of thought pieces uh, about the kinds of schools and learning opportunities that we might be able to create in the future. And Grantmakers for Education has been really grateful to organize a series of conversations around the themes. So in past webinars, which we'll drop into the chat, we've explored the goals and scope of the PK through 12 curriculum, youth and families as education leaders, rehumanizing the teaching profession, rebuilding the architecture of teaching and learning, and the future of assessment. And a consistent theme in our past conversations has been the challenge of balancing an immediate imperative to stabilize and improve the quality of the existing system that is still serving so many students, even as we work towards a future state. And the premise of this series has been that both of these two things are important, but they're distinct, and that the longer term, deeper, more nuanced work that enables transformative change has tended to get shorter shrift in both our conversations about education, as well as in funding efforts. But this moment in education, as things have been disrupted um, and our society has been sort of in upheaval from COVID, the murder of George Floyd, and the economic and political kind of state of our country provides us an opportunity um, if we choose to see it as such. So in terms of today's topic, um, as I said, it's the final in our series. And policy is what creates the architecture of public systems. Uh, there are big P policies like questions about financing and funding, articulating outcomes for the system, creating equity guardrails and holding people accountable. And then there are small P policies that are ways in which local communities or individual schools create spaces to come together and do the work, whether they articulate purpose or choose instructional approaches and how to organize young people. But they aren't completely distinct, but they do operate at different altitudes and levels of scale. So today we wanna make sure that we talk about both big and small P policies and um, feel like it's a really appropriate place to end this conversation. I am super excited um, that we have the panelists that we have today. I couldn't think of a better group um, to have this conversation with. So I'm pleased to introduce our three uh, panelists for today. Dr. Linda Darling Hammond, who's president and CEO of the Learning Policy Institute. Raymond Pierce, who's president and CEO of the Southern Education Foundation. And Sophie Finelli, who's president of the Stewart Foundation. Now I've asked each of our panelists to take about five to seven minutes to introduce themselves, their organization, and the particular perspective that they're bringing to the conversation today, both as individuals and leaders in the space. We're then gonna have a, a moderated discussion and really wanna invite all of you to take part, dropping your questions in the chat function. Let's use the chat function instead of Q&A and I'll make sure to integrate those into the discussion as we go along. So Linda, let's start with you. Um, you're the author of the article, Possible Futures, The Policy Changes We Need to Get There, in which you discuss the policy policies we need to get to the future vision of education that past uh, webinars in this series have explored. So could you share the overarching frame of the article and some of the big areas of policy you see as especially relevant in this moment? Sure, I'm happy to do that. I'm glad to be here with this esteemed group of colleagues. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity for a conversation. I'm actually going to share my screen briefly just so that I can review the policy ideas that are in the article. Uh, you know, the uh, series itself uh, really um, uh, allowed for a, a way of looking at uh, the future of ed education and the uh, creation of an opportunity to support every child that uh, we um, ground in many ways in the science of learning and development. So what I'm gonna try to do is share my screen in hopes that this will work. Why is this? Okay, I think this is about to work. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, great. 
Um, so the possible futures are really about developing the potential of each and every child in ways that are empowering for them to own the knowledge and really be able to use it in the ways that really are demanded in this century that we are in right now. And it's grounded, as I noted, in the principles of science of learning and development and in the work that came out of the handbook of the cultural foundations of learning. And I just want to call up a few of the key ideas there. One of them is that the brain is uh, not baked and done when we are born. It is always developing throughout all of life as a product of the relationships and the experiences that we have. And those, of course, determine a lot of the outcomes uh, of the process. And that's what schools are all about. We know that learning is social, emotional, and academic, that they are completely uh, intertwined with one another and how we feel about ourselves, about the environment, uh, the emotional uh, framework that we bring uh, determines whether our brain is able to actually build the neuron connections and whether we are able to free from anxiety and um, other uh, distractions that prevent learning. Uh, so those are uh, not distractions, social and emotional uh, attention, but really a pathway to academic learning. We know that children actively construct knowledge and they connect what they know to what they're learning in their cultural contexts. And we all have cultural contexts that shape what we bring to the learning process. We know that students' perceptions of their own ability influence learning. And so the ways in which we label students in school uh, are actually a, an intervention in the learning process itself. And we know that trauma and adversity, which kids have experienced so much of, uh, particularly in this country, uh, affect learning but that relationships and a sense of belonging are the most effective antidote to trauma. Finally, we know that students really demonstrate their best performance under conditions of low threat and high supports. Uh, and what uh, this uh, aggregation of science from neuroscience and many other learning and developmental sciences tells us is that many of the assumptions that undergirded the schools we now have that were developed in the early 1900s uh, are, are not true. Uh, we used to think that genes determine our intelligence, that uh, you could know uh, a student's potential in advance and we could just track students uh, accordingly. Uh, we thought that you could develop a standardized model, which was modeled on the Henry Ford assembly line uh, that featured transmission teaching, teachers telling kids what to know uh, and them remembering it uh, along the conveyor belt. And that would be the most efficient path to learning. We thought that you could teach to the average because average would stand for most individuals uh, and that talent was scarce. So we needed to identify a few people to get different treatment to develop talent. But we now know that context is the primary driver of who we become. Only 10% of genes are ever expressed and the ones that are expressed are largely a function of context. We know that potential is visible in environments that are designed to reveal it the primary job of school, that inquiry and engagement and personalized connections stimulate deep learning. And those are going to be uh, variable because uh, variation is the norm, uh, not the, um, the uh, not that, that average is the norm and that all variation is abnormal. In fact, variation is normal and talent is plentiful and it's not along a bell curve. So. When we think about reinventing school, uh, we really need to harness this knowledge of human development and learning that have been accumulated over the last century and that we need for the next. And we need to use this moment to support systemic change. Uh, LPI put out a uh, publication on restarting and reinventing school that describes this in multiple areas. And just to know that those schools <clears throat> that were designed in the early 1900s we're not designed to support relationships, full child approaches, deep learning, <laughs> and certainly not designed to produce equitable opportunity. So educators have been working within these structures, trying to push them to do things they were not designed to do. And ultimately we need policy to do that. And I'm gonna take a moment to just get a little water. <clears throat> also baked into our society and our schools 
is the anatomy of inequality. We have the most unequal system of education in the industrialized world. It begins with the highest rates of child poverty in the industrialized world in the United States uh, and growing segregation so that more and more schools are high poverty, highly segregated schools that then receive unequal school resources. That then leads to an inequitable distribution of well-prepared educators, unequal access to curriculum that is meaningful and productive, and often to dysfunctional schools. And that inequitable distribution of well-prepared educators leads to poorly organized instruction, uh, the inability quite often to teach more heterogeneous classes, which then reinforces that tracking system, which was designed by eugenicists to operate on the basis of race and class, as well as a failure to understand students' social and academic as well as uh, emotional needs. You add implicit bias, which is widespread in the society, and that adds the assumptions then that it's the students who are poorly behaved, that families don't care, leads to very harsh discriminatory and exclusionary treatment and discipline, which then reinforces um, unequal access to learning uh, and activating the stereotype threat, which causes anyone who is stereotyped in a stigmatizing society to uh, perform less well than they could perform. So we need to move obviously from the schools that were individualistic, kids you know, sort of memorizing things to spit back on their worksheets to schools in which we see this kind of collaborative inquiry oriented teaching and learning. And uh, we've actually a number of folks involved in this uh, aggregation of the science of learning and development created a set of design principles uh, that were expressed in the earlier articles uh, in various ways around what's needed in schools to ensure the positive developmental relationships, the environments filled with safety and belonging, the rich inquiry-oriented learning experiences, the explicit development of social and emotional skills, habits and mindsets, and the provision of the integrated support systems that individual students need to remove obstacles to learning that would really allow us to have the kinds of schools on a wide, base widely available basis that we have in a few exceptional schools today. So there are three areas of policy that I outlined in the uh, article uh, that really are needed to help us get there. The first set of policies are really to just create the school conditions that could enable students to thrive. That means all schools with adequate and equitable funding, which is really, uh, we are far from that in more than 30 states that have not redesigned their funding systems. We need schools with the kind of wraparound services like community schools that support the whole child with health, mental health, social services, uh, and uh, before and after school, expanded learning time that then really allow all children to get the resources they need. We need an on-ramp with high quality preschool. And then we need a kind of accountability that actually supports schools in continuously improving rather than seeking to punish the schools that serve the highest need students uh, and need the most uh, supportive um, investments. The second area is that we need to design schools for healthy development. Uh, we need to create relationship-centered school structures uh, rather than kids, for example, in middle and high schools, going from one teacher to another every 45 minutes uh, with no home base, uh, where teachers are teaching independently and not planning around students. We need them to be in structures where they have a home base, where there are adults who know them well, where a team of teachers takes care of a group of students together. Uh, and there are uh, explicit kinds of outreach uh, funded and supported for work with parents and families. Uh, that means we need to replace exclusionary discipline with restorative practices. We see in the research that those practices that really create community and bond uh, kids to the community with supports uh, lead to higher achievement and also stronger mental health uh, and safer schools. We need to, curriculum instruction and assessment to be designed for deeper learning that is meaningful and transferable. 
that extended learning time will allow all students to be able to uh, learn in ways that are responsive to their needs. Uh, and as I noted, we have to prioritize that family engagement, which was not designed into the schools that we have now. And then the last area of uh, policy is to really always prepare and enable educators uh, to provide academic and developmental support. Uh, you know, there's no other way to get to the schools we need than to do that through the knowledge and skills and commitments of the educators who are in them. Uh, we can't treat teachers as you know, uh, assembly line workers, uh, as widgets in a great machine of schooling. Uh, we have to design the ways in which they enter so that they are fully supported to get access to strong preparation so that what we ask them to demonstrate is related to what students need in their learning so that we accredit the programs who prepare them in the ways that build on this knowledge base uh, and that offer ongoing professional learning throughout their careers. Uh, and in the United States, as we know, educators uh, are underpaid uh, by about 20% relative to other uh, professions. Uh, many of them come into the profession without adequate preparation because they can't afford to access high quality preparation. And we create then this vicious cycle particularly in high need communities as a result of not attending to these policies that high achieving countries have been attending to for some time. Great, thank you so much, Linda. So much there um, that I'm looking forward to unpacking in our conversation. Um, and Raymond and Sophie, I'm, I'm so glad you're both here because part of what you're both doing is kind of working with many of these areas in the specific context that you're in. So Raymond, I wanna start with you. Um, you are working in the South. Um, which is a unique context on so many levels. So uh, could you tell us about the policy work that you've been engaged with and are hoping to be engaged with? And how does your particular context shape your strategies and tactics when it comes to moving policy change forward? Well, thank you, Olga. And I, I wanna congratulate um, Linda uh, yet again on just an outstanding and comprehensive articulation of, uh, of public schools and, and what is needed to, to improve. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that has can articulate that as well and comprehensively as, as Linda is able to. And there's not much I would even add to that. Um, the challenge, of course, um, is uh, bringing it about. And you know, to answer your question, Elka, uh, here in the South, uh, we have some particular cha challenges there, which are understandable given the history here in the South and the policies and the practices that are rooted uh, in uh, not just de jure, but de facto segregation, uh, that uh, the vestiges of which continue to this day. And um, it is very, very difficult um, to engage in the conversations uh, for policy changes and, and implementation of, of more effective ways of educating our children along the lines of what uh, you know, Linda has so eloquently you know, stated. It's very difficult to do that in um, a highly politically charged uh, context in which uh, public education exists. Now, that's not to say that public education nationwide, probably internationally in some places, uh, is not political. I tell people all the time uh, that the education of Black people has always been political uh, in this nation. When has it not been political? Uh, Brown versus Board of Education was not just litigation, it was political. Um, but the, the challenge is, is in finding those common grounds and those opportunities and those abilities to negotiate through those impediments uh, and bring about the foundation that allow the patient to breathe uh, and to be able to, um, to incorporate and take on uh, the well thought out, well researched uh, ideas that, uh, again, Linda has pointed out, uh, that the system is just uh, not geared to, uh, to adopt now. Um, you know, we talked earlier, Olka, I think a week or so ago, um, and particularly in, in directly into the audience of um, uh, philanthropy uh, and those who want to invest in improve, improving public education. Um, I, I, we strongly believe at the Southern Education Foundation, and we're not the only ones, uh, that um, you have to engage policymakers when you want to change policy. And um, who are the policymakers? Where there are uh, variety of them, uh, a number of them. Um, obviously, you got to start with the governance. Um, public education is local. Um, and so you got to engage the governance. And that means the public school boards. 
and you got to engage the administrators. That means the state school superintendents and the, and the district school superintendents. Uh, you know, th these bodies are, uh, I believe, are all good people, uh, but they're on treadmills, and um, and it's hard for them to get off that treadmill. It's hard for them to slow down. And when they're dealing with all the issues and the business and other problems and the politics and so forth, to be able to slow down, um, to think about how can we uh, actually bring about the change again, uh, that Linda has pointed out in, in, in her, 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 her article. Um, so uh, at the Southern Education Foundation, it's nothing new. Uh, I think, you know, this is something we've been doing for 150 something years, uh, plus years. And, you know, get, get tracing our history back to right after the Civil War, um, philanthropy combining with Black folks coming out of enslavement uh, to get books into the South, uh, to build schools where the students can, children can come and learn to read, and to train teachers. There were no teachers, there were no books, there were no schools, and that's our history. And then ultimately to sustain that, um, philanthropy couldn't keep paying for that. So somewhere in the second or third year after Reconstruction, uh, during the Reconstruction period uh, in the Civil War, while the troops are still here in the South, uh, raising the taxes to sustain and pay for that. It's always been a fight. It's always been a struggle because um, ultimately those taxes began to get segregated. Uh, taxes from whites go to pay for white schools. Taxes for blacks go to pay for white schools. And I don't want to go too much in that history. I'm just saying, I'm saying that um, the dynamics really have not changed. You know, the elements of 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 race and, and class um, uh, in a, in a, have, have, you know, never been totally rooted out of, of public education. And so uh, I, I, I think, you know, it, there may be some nuances to perfect upon, um, you know, what, you know, Linda has articulated, I don't see them, <laughs> but I think what what we have to do, what we try to do here at the Southern Education Foundation, along with our friends at the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Education Law Center uh, and others, is not just challenge uh, the inequities. And oftentimes we find ourselves having to challenge them in court, but trying to find ways uh, to bring policymakers to the table to educate them um, on, uh, on school improvement, to educate them along the lines of everything Linda just talked about to uh, they don't have the time, these policymakers, even school board members, they don't have the time to uh, read up on and, and study and learn the things that, again, Linda articulated. Uh, but if organizations like ours or our, our political leaders and philanthropy uh, can take the time to invest in models and uh, training camps or um, uh, fellowships, uh, sort of like they did at the Kennedy School of Government years ago by creating that uh, was that uh, the Institute for State Senators and State Representatives? If we can start doing things like that uh, on an annual, consistent, nonstop basis, uh, bringing people involved in public education, particularly people who are coming onto school boards, particularly people who are in state superintendents' offices, constantly and regularly bringing them into cohorts and classes, um, you know, where they can learn about uh, research-based school reform improvement models. You can then begin to develop a, a I think, a critical mass of, of understanding uh, that says, yeah, you know, um, uh, I may be hearing from this crowd over here that they don't want their children in a classroom where they're learning about issues, you know, that you know conflict with my values at home, or I don't want to hear about this, but I do want my child to learn how to read, write, and add, <laughs> reading, writing, arithmetic. So how can we, um, you know, get get a major uh, our focus back on that? Uh, so that's the challenge for us, Alfred. That's what we're engaged in. Um, it's not enough. There are not enough um, troops <laughs> uh, on the ground in this fight. Just not enough. Um, it has to be sustained. And um, so I'm always uh, putting out that call, um, you know, to get more people to slow down, particularly here in the South, and um, find that common ground uh, of interest in the education of our children and find out those areas um, where we can make improvement and I examine the, the ways that we can go about making those improvement and bringing about the changes that, again, um, are, are, are outlined in, in uh, Linda's article. Thanks, Raymond. Um, and I loved the really specific example, right, for funders, this idea of bringing people together um, to help educate and begin a conversation about the things that maybe to some of us feel obvious, 
but aren't necessarily for the folks who day in and day out are working to make no. this work. So we'd love to come back to that. Um, Sophie, um, I'm curious about kind of your work and how you're thinking about policy in the context of the Stewart Foundation's evolving strategy, um, especially in California, where you're trying to pull together different elements of your investments over the last decade in new ways. So tell us a little bit about, um, about that. Sure, thank you so much for having me. And it's hard to go after Linda's masterclass and, and Raymond, um, but I'll do my best uh, to, to talk a little bit about what we're doing here at the Stewart Foundation. So just a little bit about, more about us. We're based in California and we're focused on uh, thriving adolescents and, and transforming systems for equity. Uh, I'm gonna keep my remarks short, but I wanna make kind of three points um, and then get into the conversation as much as possible. I thought uh, Raymond in particular, I think your last point, um, we want, hope that we get back to it. Uh, but first, let me emphasize a key point that Linda really makes in, made in the presentation, but really in the article, uh, which is that policy shifts won't be successful without two critical conditions in place, right? The first one is adequate and equitable funding based on student need, and I'll come back to it. And then the second one is aligned and supportive accountability and continuous improvement systems that focus on students' opportunities to learn and not just on reaching a particular test score. So, okay, you asked a little bit about what we're doing at the foundation, what we've been doing. And one thing that we we're going to keep on doing is focusing on school funding. Um, and give you a couple of examples of what it looks like, right? Uh, in practice for grant makers. I know this is this is our audience today. So at the local level it means you know, stay the course and you know, engage with grassroots organizers, build a coalition of the willing, um, and stay at it. Uh, you know, we've been doing this at the foundation well before I joined uh, for, you know, probably 15 years or more of focusing on, on school funding. Um, so for other grant makers out there, one way to start working on resource equity is to join in with other foundations, you know, join in with in collaboratives like the Resource Equity Funders Collaborative that the Stuart Foundation is part of, uh, which works both at the state and at the national level. Uh, in partnership, and that's really important, uh, with local organizations to drive equitable school funding policies. So, you know, whether, and this is something that we have to learn in philanthropy, if your own strategy is on early childhood, maybe it's art education, maybe it's STEM, maybe you want to transform middle school, what well, you have to focus on school funding system, right? That's one of these kind of necessary conditions. Um, so I really want to emphasize um, that point that Linda made in the article. The second one, obviously, is accountability systems. Um, and, you know, we're in a better policy environment than we were under No Child Left Behind um, to create the conditions for more thoughtful conversations about how we measure success. So in California, for example, we're not fully there, but, you know, our accountability system includes measures around parent involvement, uh, school climate, so we look at suspensions and other metrics, uh, student engagement, uh, looking at, you know, chronic absenteeism, or um, surveys. And, and as Linda said earlier, we really need to start painting a more whole child, a more holistic picture of the contributors to student and school success. Um, we know that you know, the wrong uh, measures of success, particularly in the early years of a reform, can serve to undermine uh, an initiative. Uh, so if you look at community schools that have you know, been funded and at the foundation, we've been supporting community schools for over 20 years, we're going against you know, the policy environment, or finally at a moment where um, there is potential transformation. So that's really exciting. So instead of improving just test scores and graduation rates, initially we should be looking at leading indicators. That's something that, you know, policymakers don't always want to do, uh, or frankly, funders, right? We, we tend to want to see short-term returns. So look at our families more involved, our students coming to school more often, uh, you know, on surveys of students saying that they feel more safe and seen and, and supported? Do they have healthy relationships with adults on campus so they feel, um, um, so they have all the support they need? So that's, that's one in terms of like critical policy conditions, the evergreen work that we have to do in philanthropy, regardless of our, our policy you know, preferences or our, our strategies. Uh, my second point, and I know we'll, okay, we talked a little bit about this in the prep call, is that we have to think beyond policy wins, right? Or campaign wins, and we need to really fund implementation. And Linda talks about that quite a bit, but you know, we have to fund implementation faithfully and over a period of time. And trust me, I know it's hard, it's a hard sell. 
to foundation boards and, and uh, to, to um, policymakers, but it takes time to transform uh, a system and to build a capacity. So don't just fund policy change, um, you know, because alone it won't change the experiences, the opportunities for young people or for educators on the ground. Um, so third point really is that we should, and that's something that the Shaw Foundation is really trying to do better at and improve, is that we have to have more investments in narrative and story. Um, we have to elevate the shifts in practices, culture, and the experience of students, families, and educators. And it's less easy, you know, that might be easy to quantify, but that's an important uh, role of philanthropy, I think. So the storytelling uh, is something that we're really thinking about at the foundation. I'd love to hear more from Raymond in particular, like how, how you do storytelling, how you think about a narrative that will be in context and in place, but also you know, a meta narrative at the national level along the lines of, what, of Linda's article. Um, so that leads me to kind of the last point, which is uh, often we focus so much on technical fixes and policy shifts, and we really have to think about changing mind, not just changing policies. And so a um, couple of things here, ownership matters, right? So the more stakeholders are involved uh, in designing or contributing to that new policy development, the more invested there will be in the implementation and its success. Um, for us at the foundation, Stuart, that means really listening to young people. We're really learning to do that better. Their hopes, their ideas, their aspirations. You know, they they have amazing ideas. The system is not designed to listen to them. Um, and also to be attuned to the, you know, invisible fears, I guess, and insecurities that keep us, and by us, I mean the adults in philanthropy or frankly, the adults in the system, that keep us stuck, even when we know that our current way of doing business doesn't serve us well. Um, and I think that's probably the hardest uh, piece of this. Um, so you add the anxiety that all of us are experiencing and have experienced the last few years, uh, you know, anxiety in the face of change. So I would say, let's pay more attention to how people are feeling and thinking uh, when they're asked to embrace transformation and figure out how to build conditions where people feel safe to innovate and try new things. And then I'll, you know, Amen. 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 <laughs> yes. Amen to all of you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, there's so many directions we could go, um, and I hope we'll get to go in a bunch of them. And for those of you who are um, on the call um, listening, please do start to drop your questions into the chat so that we can make sure to dig into the areas that you're interested in. Um, but I want to take, I want to just first zoom out. And you all have addressed this in some ways, but I want to really underscore it, right? If we're serious about racial justice, and if we're serious about true equity in the sense of making sure that every child has what they need to reach their unique potential, why is it no longer sufficient to have most of our funding, if not all of it, go into tinkering with and sort of making small changes to the current system versus this kind of deeper, longer term investment that really is about a transformed system? Because yeah. I think that may be one of the things we have to keep in mind for when things get hard. Yeah, I'd love to just start us off and then I know uh, Raymond and Sophie will have a lot to say on this, but um, you know, a lot of philanthropy has been around planting little innovations. You know, there's this little program here, there's that program there and so on. And then we wonder why they don't scale up. But when you have the dramatic inequalities that we have in just, um, you know, in the society, first of all, right now, we're more unequal than we've been since 1929 when the stock market crashed. We have 1% of the public holding 50% of the wealth, right? And more than, uh, and 10 times more than the bottom 50% of people combined, you know? So kids are starting out in very different places in terms of the, just the economic well being. And then you layer on this dramatic inequality in funding where in any given state, you may spend three times as much in some districts as others. And in some states, you spend three times as much as in other states. And it's all tied to race and class. So you can't expect these little innovations to take off if we aren't equitably resourcing yeah. the schools. Uh, and and you know, it's, it is the eugenicist frame of mind that continues, that Raymond spoke to, that it's okay, people think it's okay 
to allow students of color to be in school environments that are so profoundly lacking in so many ways. And so you've really got to tackle the policy um, infrastructure. Yeah, I, uh, I, again, you, I totally agree with everything Linda just said. I think she used the word is so dramatic. It's just so huge. Um, I, you know, philanthropy has, um, it should be applauded for its work in, in the past. and. But it's just what you said, okay, that's tinkering. Um, and you're not gonna make changes by tinkering. It's just too massive. The mindset has not gone away. Uh, I'm just gonna say this. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, in the history of the Southern Education Foundation, when we were the Slater Fund, and um, we were moving uh, somewhere around the 1870s, 1880s, you know, about 20, 30 years after the Civil War, uh, to sustain what philanthropy was doing, you know, these books and these teachers and these buildings. Um, by having, to, you know, landowners pay taxes. Uh, there was this article that said that there was a uh, a white plant, former plantation owner sitting on his steps at, in Virginia, watching three or four black children walk past his land, previously had they had been enslaved, uh, on their way to school. And he said, and I have to pay for this? And so see that mentality, when did that mentality go away? When? I mean, who's going to say that that culture has gone away? It has not gone away. They're just some people think that, you know, taxes for public education is a waste of money. Some people believe that. And with that type of mindset, um, tinkering with a system that is where inequity is baked in, it was cooked in as a major ingredient, you know, for public education, tinkering is not going to change that. It has to be a massive political movement of political will. Um, nationwide, not just in the South or the West or the East and North, it's got to be nationwide political will to make that change. I believe there was a time when we were on our way toward that, probably 10, 15, 20 years after Brown, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, somewhere around there, there was a little bit of momentum picking up in that area. Um, but as my good friend Deval Patrick always says, is Raymond, it was abandoned. It was abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we lost so much ground. Uh, so look, I don't want to talk go too far on that, but uh, just to answer your question, Elka, uh, no, tinkering doesn't work. It has to be massive. We have to develop the conditions for um, the, the policy change that Linda talks about to get a chance to breathe. And a lot of that is education. A lot of that is awareness. A lot of that is bringing people together, uh, pros and cons, people on all sides of the aisle, bringing them together, finding the common ground and, start, and saying, this is what's the best for our entire nation, and here's how we can build a public education system um, uh, better than any on the planet. And our, and our country and our, and our children deserve it. Can I just add that where we've done that, there are about a dozen states where progressive reforms have come in and where more money is spent on the education of students who need it the most and where there's an adequate resource base and investments in the quality of teachers and so on. You see the huge gains in achievement. You see the reduction of the achievement gap. Yeah. You see greater productivity, business productivity, and ability to attract a, an economic base in those states. And everyone gains because when students come out of school uh, with higher graduation rates and more skills and can enter the workforce and pay more taxes, the entire state you know, gains um, in many, many ways. So we also have to have people both respond to the moral calling and understand it's in our national best interest to make those investments. I, I, I got it. I give me 10 seconds. Think of the national leaders we had 20, 30 years ago. Governors, uh, my former boss, Dick Riley, uh, governor of uh, South Carolina, the governor of Georgia, Roy Barnes, the governor of Colorado, governor of North Carolina, Jim Hunt. Where are they now? Name name anybody like that now. Where is the political will, the leadership? Gavin Newsom. Uh, yeah, Gavin Newsom. That's, <laughs> that's, that's West Coast. <laughs> that's yeah. West Coast. Um, so uh, I just named three Southern governors. Yeah. <laughs> for the, uh, so where are they? Um, um, they've been overwhelmed uh, by a a a sentiment, a culture that had never never died out. Um, it's just been unleashed. And so you can't, it's hard to have a conversation uh, at, the, at the school board of Jackson, Mississippi or Nashville, Tennessee or Tallahassee, Florida or, or Atlanta. It's hard to have those 
within a state system um, where they're more concerned with critical race theory uh, and sex education. Uh, it's, it's hard to have those conversations, almost impossible to have those conversations to advance the, 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 the much needed policy change uh, that we're discussing. Now that I, just to, it's hard to add anything to this, um, again, the incredible conversation that, you know, just to talk about California, we do have counties, you know, and, and cities where these same similar issues come up, right, around uh, LGBTQ students or uh, critical, so unfortunately, as we said that at the beginning, focusing on resource equity, to me, that's the, that's the number one, number two, number three, you know, priority. It takes a long time talking about public education as a public good, talking about it as a critical component of a state success. I mean, you know, in, everybody in their own context might have different stories, but we need to do a lot better at telling that story. I'll give you one example, which is we, along with other California funders, support the Advancement Project California, now called California, uh, for what they call the water pool. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a conference, you know, the really cool video was on, on Zoom, but I think it's going to be a second person uh, next year, um, to bring people together across the spectrum of, of views around the water cooler to have a conversation, how to build common ground, and where they've been successful is around, you know, school funding, and blurring the line and getting more attention to early childhood, uh, which was very much a good piece well for the students to pay attention. So, you know, ways to do it, it takes, it takes resources, it takes time, it has to be, it's about relationship, it's about trust. Um, so that's one thing. The other one, Olka, is you talked about two things, I wanna push a little bit on that term, because I think it can be demoralizing for people inside the system uh, to feel like what they're doing is tinkering when it can be really transformative. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, the international students here in California, in San Francisco, you know, a few years ago started to uh, allow students to stay for six and six years. Right? And that was going against kind of this idea that we measure graduation as four years, and if you're not doing well, all the incentives were against that approach. For an international high school, and I think it's been documented in a case study by LPR, so thank you, Linda, and your team. Um, what they do is that starting in 11th grade, young people are not only taking their regular classes, but they're also taking college classes in dual enrollment and they have pre-internships. Yeah. And they do that in 11th grade and 12th grade, and then in that fifth year, and maybe that sixth year, uh, and they see incredible success. Right? Young people graduate and then they stay engaged with them as they transition to higher ed to a career for at least a year. And guess what? It works. And you know, you could think about it as tinkering, or you could say, no, that's actually the first seed of true transformation. Right? Yeah. It's uh, blurring, blurring your lines with higher ed. It's it's focusing on relational uh, strength. If they have an advisor that stays with them for a couple of years. So there are um, for some of these that may appear to be tinkering, but are really transformative. And so I just wanted to maybe kind of um, disrupt this idea that old policy is capital P, big change in, in you know, at, at, in the state capital or in the federal level. Um, I think there are some huge transformational moments at the school level. And what can everybody needs to do is tell the story, right? Yeah. Run some case studies, make sure that people know about this approach, bring that story to policymakers and change policy environment so that if you keep your kids for another year for so five or six years you're not punished for it um, so yeah. That's great. No, thank you for that push, Sophie. Um, and you're right, tinkering is a is a strange word. And I think we're all kind of pointing at something that is more than just an individual intervention versus something then that is to your point more systemic. Right. Um, there's been a comment and I was having some trouble too, Sophie, hearing you. So I don't know if while we go on to the next question, if you can put your audio closer or if there's something with Wi-Fi. Um, just two things I want to I, I want to note too. Like you use the term progressive, Linda, in some of the states. And you know, progressive is often seen as political, but there is something about policies that say, you know, every child should have access to a home and to food and to health care and to a, you know, a family that has basic income to make their needs met. And when we point at other countries that are doing a really good job, many of them have some of those basic safety nets and some of those basic pieces. And so that's something to just bring into this conversation that all of these things can't always be put on education. And there is, you know, a conversation about what's the intersection for education funders between purely education policies and then all these other things that feel like they're part of a transformed um, system. 
you've all already- Reagan mentioned, by the way, you know, in the 60s and 70s, when we had a social policy, the Great Society, the War on Poverty, and so that was taking care of a lot of those things, cut child poverty in half, invested in equitable schools, et cetera. We cut the achievement gap in half in uh, reading between black and white students in that period of time. And in the 1980s, almost all of those policies were undone both for schools and for the society as a whole. We're at a moment now where we're trying to reinstate yes. a framework like that, uh, which is why this inflection point is so important. Yeah. Critical time for it, critical time. I think you called it a reset, uh, Linda, in one of your early articles. I mean, this is a, this is a great opportunity to do just that. Um, okay, if I may, I mean, I just saw some of the polls a couple weeks ago after the midterm elections. Uh, where the majority of Americans do want um, support equity. The majority of Americans do support equity. Um, the majority of Americans do understand that there are still inequities. Uh, so how do we take advantage of that true sentiment that unfortunately is being uh, exploited and suppressed uh, for political gain? How do we find a way um, to grab that common ground so that we can create, again, the conditions, I'm repeating myself, to allow these types of policy change, uh, changes to get a hold. Uh, we, the country's done it before, obviously. I mean, it, this yeah. is nothing new. We've done it before. So that's a really good segue, um, Raymond, to something else. So you've all talked about the realities. You know, we've got local discussions about critical race theory and whether kids should be taught this part of history or that part of history. Um, and, and there is a sense that that is a small group of very loud people that would like to disrupt us or to kind of take us take our attention away from the bigger conversations. Like, what is your sense of how funders and others need to balance paying attention to for sure, and kind of responding to that, but not losing focus. Because I think in some ways, Ian Haney Lopez was somebody we had on at a certain point. And he said, look, there are a small group of people that would love to undermine public education, uh, public education and foment distrust and make people think it's not working so that we won't invest in it. So at this moment, that feels particularly important because so much of our time feels like it's sucked up um, by things that people want us to spend time on instead of the real issues. Yeah, no, I mean, just to jump on this, it, you know, I think we need to be comfortable in philanthropy with all the tools at our disposal, both defense and offense, right? I mean, so in some places you have to think about litigation and you have to maintain these equity guardrails. And, you know, in other places we, we have to tell an affirmative story. And I think that's, it's hard, right, to, to hold uh, both set of tactics together and sometimes hard to make the case internally that you, you fight to maintain uh, um, equity and then you uh, have to tell an affirmative vision. I mean, I think that's, uh, Linda, your presentation really did a great job of saying like, here's where we came from, here's the vision that we can look toward. And then in order to get there, there's gonna be you know, fights at the local level. There's no, no way around it. Uh, and sometimes we're timid. Um, so I think there's a role for us to really uh, be a buffer also for yes. local communities and and and, uh, and some of our partners who need us to be in front, uh, uh, to be willing to stand with them. Yes, Sophie, yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you know, think about what some of the, uh, I hate to use conservative and liberal, but you know, some of the conservative groups did, and I don't name names, you know, Alec and the Koch brothers, and back then the Walton Foundation, let's be honest, you know, I, I, that's what I thought, um, that's what I know really launched a major campaign, uh, to, not just to promote charter schools, but even so far as to promote vouchers, you know, to taking away a public education dollars to support education in private schools. Um, and that, a lot of that campaign, a major part of that campaign was targeted towards black folks. I, I, I can't tell you the number of organ, you know, conferences and conventions, social organization groups, you got a paid guy there, a woman there, saying things like public education has failed black people. You know, and things like that, or you know, uh, you know, we need the money for private schools and you know, unchecked charter schools. And I mean, we've got a lot of good charter schools, of course, but that was a movement. That was, you know, so that was a movement. You know, where has been the philanthropy on the other side of that? You know, to defend public education, to enlighten people, um, to to bring more common sense again along the lines of what everything Linda's saying. Uh, in a sustained, uh, purposeful way, campaign, basically, 
to allow people to calm down, uh, understand the distractions of critical race theory. And, you know, I'm you're teaching my daughter or child to, to be something or be someone that I don't, you know, that is not my value or something like that. Just get away from that and get on the fundamental issues of a quality education that everybody agrees with. It's, um, I, it can be done. And I think philanthropy can't be afraid of the politics. <laughs> they can't be afraid of the politics. Again, when has public education in this nation not been political? So I want to make sure, uh, since I invited folks to drop questions in the chat, I want to make sure that we get to them. But I'm going to ask if we can keep the, the responses a little brief so we can get through a bunch of them. So Tasha, um, you asked, you said, I'm grateful to Linda for sharing that brain development and intelligence isn't fixed and has the potential for growing. She's been um, following the research on trauma and appreciates the warnings about it, but is concerned with the pigeonholing of traumatized children and adults that could happen with a message like that. So could you speak to that, please? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of discourse around trauma informed practice and, you know, explaining to people how trauma influences the brain. But there is the danger that people will see that again as fixed. Right. Like, OK, now you've had that. So the, and it's not fixed. And we know, um, you know, first of all, that trauma, the effects of trauma can be reversed, uh, that uh, relationships and supports of various kinds are Important, you know, if you think about where some of the neuroscience is coming from, people who've had strokes, who've had traumatic brain injuries in accidents and so on, and how they can reclaim functions um, is partly a, a matter of how the brain gets, you know, exercised and, you know, all the therapies that could go along with it. And it's also a function of being able to find places to um, get the relational supports that are necessary. And both of those things matter. So we need trauma-informed practice that is healing-oriented. And I've begun to help people think about what does that mean in school? How do you uh, deal with the fact, I mean, we have about half of the children in the United States experience adverse childhood experiences every year. Uh, we create a lot of trauma in our society for children. Uh, and some schools also add on to the trauma. And what we need are schools that are uh, you know, respond to kids when their behavior is, you know, um, dysregulated, as the psychologists say, uh, with what's going on, what's happening with you, how can I help, rather than get out of here, you know, go to the principal's office or whatever the other kind of responses might be. And, and so we really, there are um, sciences of healing that need to be understood along with the understanding of how trauma affects us each of us uh, in various ways. Uh, and it is, and it's very important that we not pigeonhole because it becomes just another excuse for um, not helping and supporting, you know, um, lots and lots of students. I've appreciated the shift towards healing centered modalities right. and practices because it does feel like it sort of points your attention to what could be as opposed to what's been um, and fixate you there. Grace Carr asked, what role do you think the business community can play in helping to move or push education reforms in the right direction? A big role, mm -hmm. <laughs> a big role, a big role. Become familiar again with the uh, the research and, and the policy suggestions that again uh, Linda has written. Um, the business community should get themselves um, acquainted with that. Uh, get their lobbyists and their government affairs and community affairs representatives to understand that, uh, and not be afraid to engage uh, the local authorities, the local governance structures, particularly school boards, on hey, look, how can we um, you know settle things here in the school district so that uh, we can begin to adopt the, you know, productive changes. It's in, the, it's in the best interest of the business community. I mean, they need good workers, they need an educated workforce. So yes, they play, they can play a very big role. I, am, I completely agree. And they need a differently educated workforce, right? I mean, the problems of 21st century for business are not the ones from, uh, you know, the assembly line of 200 years ago. So I think you can find lots of great allies in the business community talking about what kind of skills and, you know, and mindsets you want your, employees to have, how, what kind of creative thinkers you want. So, you know, I think engaging them uh, is critical both on the design of school, but also, again, on these kind of larger policy questions of resource equity and, and accountability and measuring. You know, I think most businesses don't really care how, how, what you got on your SAT, right? Um, <laughs> they really want to know that you can work with others 
uh, that you're collaborative, that you are, um, that you, you know, so that's, there's a lot for us to do. And if we want evidence of that, you know, the, a lot of the reform movement kind of um, goals were supported by local chambers of commerce, et cetera, in an effort to improve education. And to your point, right, we're 20 years further down the line. And I think what these kinds of more deeper learning human-centered approaches produce right. is what employers now say they need. That's so, right. Um, Becca Katz asked, and I'm going to change the wording, Becca, just a little bit because we use tinkering here and we want to avoid that word. But she said, I hear and agree with the need to transform public ed policy and implementation. She's wondering how these system level goals can be supported by smaller scale, localized, maybe even district or school based changes that give immediate benefits um, for right now. So I think it's that question of what's the relationship between the immediate work and potentially this longer term vision. And work. I'd love to just build on what Sophie was starting with, and maybe Sophie, you want to add to this. But um, if you, one of the reforms in in California is some, called something uh, it's called link learning, and students right. are involved in, you know, uh, very uh, applied ways of learning with lots of supports and so on. Uh, and it started out as nine districts, you know, with little programs. But what it is now 600 pathways, we've just gotten another half a billion dollars from the state government to launch more pathways uh, like this. So you can start small and then think about how do you document what the successes are? How do you document what was needed to enable those successes? How do you then hold that up so that people can see it? And then how do you engage policymakers in thinking about how do we make this widespread? So you can start small, but you can still get to a very much more systemic outcome if you have that frame of reference. Right, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that the example I gave of internationals is you know, it's a perfect blend of a link learning approach with removing some of these policy barriers that Linda talked about, right? Like allowing schools to keep young people longer uh, ensuring that there's resources to hold their hands through the transition to higher ed, you know, blurring the lines. I don't know how many higher ed funders we have here on the call, but that's another uh, place of innovation, right? Thinking about admissions differently and uh, having young people show what they know in portfolios rather than just, uh, you know, letting them in based on their SAT scores, which I know we're thankfully shifting away from. So a lot of that came from tinkering or experimenting if we uh, at the local level uh, and telling that story uh, to Linda's point. And a different way to kind of say it too is right if you have a future vision what you invest in in the short term might look different. So had we been thinking right. this vision you might not have had accountability systems that double down on test scores. You might have done accountability in a way that was about improvement and consistent improvement. Um, I We have a minute and I said I would ask you what gives you hope but I'm gonna ask this question instead. What is a reasonable timeline and time scale for these kinds of changes to be made with both policy and implementation in mind? Because it feels like it's important to start with a realistic sense of two years, 10 years. Are we going to, what should we be looking at at five years? What's your thought on that as a, as a closing? I put in the chat um, something called Investing for Student Success, which tells the stories of states that have taken a very comprehensive approach to equity-oriented and science of learning-informed reforms. And over the course of a decade, you could see the results. But you know, you start now and you can begin to see results within two or three years. We're experiencing that in California. You've got to lean in on implementation as well as policy enactment, as Sophie said. Raymond, Sophie. I was on mute. I agree. <laughs> I was on mute. I agree. Uh, it takes some time, but I think, uh, again, what Linda just said, um, you start now. Um, you know, the data shows in states like California and others where you can begin to see some results in two, three years. I, I think it's a long, you know, term strategy, 10, 12, 15 years. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's the long view, but I think it's both end. Right. And so start supporting schools today. I have a high school teacher at home. Um, and so, you know, support teachers, give them space um, and cover so they can um, do what they know is best for kids, sometimes against uh, the system, you know, in spite of the system, and then keep working at changing the system. Uh, hopefully, we can do both. We don't have to choose. And um, this, 
I wish we had another hour for this conversation. I do too, uh, but we don't. And I'm afraid we're a minute over. And Sophie, I know you have a holiday party to get to with your colleagues and the rest of you have a busy days. Thank you so much um, for joining us to all of our panelists. Thank you to those of us, those of you who are attending. Um, we do have another program um, that's coming up soon at Grant Makers for Education. The video of this call, since there was so much, will be up in about a week. And then we have Where Do We Go From Here? Anti-Racist Philanthropy um, that will be this Thursday. Thursday, December 15th. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.